So thank you very much for having me discuss this paper. Uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of an introduction. Uh, what I'd like to do is kind of sort of give a perspective of a state of play uh, in terms of factor modeling and finance. Uh, but just in terms of an introduction to this paper, it's truly an excellent paper. So I think all of you should take some time to read it. Uh, for me, it was very enlightening just in terms of Bayesian asset pricing generally. I thought the authors did a tremendous job in their exposition. Um, and I don't, I, I really want to emphasize that point. I feel like it's a great opportunity to get educated on the state of Bayesian asset pricing. Um, so I think the time that you're spending here is going to be a well spent, a good investment in your time. Okay, so I want to start um, by way of introduction with just asking the question, why do we study factor models? I mean, I'm going to give you kind of two caricatures perspectives. So first, let me start from the, the perspective of the asset manager. The way I think about an asset manager and their interaction with factor models is to sort of say, listen, I have a pretty good sense of what the risks are. I see what returns look like. And I essentially want to know where can I get a good deal. All right. So from this perspective, the factor model is predominantly a risk model. And in this point of view, it's critical to get the risk right. All right. So I want to be thinking about this in terms of I, it's really essential to me that I have a high time series R squared, all right? I'm gonna be thinking about, you know, where I can get a good deal in terms of this alpha versus the whole model. As an asset manager, I don't have a ton of interest in the specific nature of the individual factors, but I do have a lot of interest in the nature of the alpha. For example, is it something that I can actually capture or are there limits to arbitrage? With this view of emphasis on risk in terms of this high time, seri high time series R squared, I'd say that the asset manager doesn't have much in terms of utility considerations that they're thinking about. It's really a focus on particular types of risk, variance risk, or maybe drawdown risk. All right, so I wanna contrast that with the point of view of say a behavioral scientist and their usage of a factor model. All right, so in this setting, I might think about a behavioral scientist is approaching the problem as saying something like, listen, I'm working under an economic assumption that returns are likely to compensate for risk. I get to see these, these returns. And now I want to ask specifically the behavioral question. What are the risks that investors are responding to? All right. So in this case, we're thinking about an R squared in a different direction. I'm particularly interested in the alignment between average returns and exposures to factors, right? So the behavioral scientist really cares most about cross-sectional R squared. And in this sense, the nature of the factor is of central interest. I wanna understand not so much about what is the nature of the alpha or the pricing errors that show up, but what is it that investors seem most sensitive to? All right. Now, because this essentially takes away from a major consideration that the time series R squared, the risk component, I view this as essentially an openness to subtle utility considerations. And this is the direction in which a lot of the, the economics literature is going. All right. So where does this leave us from the perspective of an em empirical asset pricer? Um, in one hand, they're sort of like the asset manager. On the other hand, they're sort of like the behavioral scientist. And there's a bit of a schizophrenia that's sort of taken over the empirical asset pricing perspective on factor models. And I would think of it as sort of boiling down to this question, can I find any model that I can sort of shoehorn into the empirical patterns that I observe um, among asset returns? So how is the asset pricer like a behavioral scientist? Well, they like to do asset pricing tests, right? And we like to focus on the risk premia that we estimate from cross-sectional regressions. But at the same time, we've really gone down this path of focusing on statistical factor models. The statistical factor models don't have clear economic identification of what those factors are. So we're thinking a lot about risk premium estimates, but we've sort of lost the identity, the nature of the factors. I think this is a little bit of a difficult situation to be in, um, but when you think about how it is that we got here, maybe it's not so surprising. So we're facing a lot of hard problems when we're trying to think about studying financial markets. Both the statistics of studying financial markets are hard because we have the vast majority of the variation driven by news, right? The arrival of unforecastable shocks. And of course, the behavioral science of financial markets is, is, is extremely hard because we're dealing in these complex systems. All right, so 
I'm going to essentially lead into the paper now with this perspective on what factor models have been doing in the literature. Um, this paper takes the state of the asset pricing literature as given. So in some sense, it's going to be working in the schizophrenic view in the sense that it's really going to be focusing on inference in terms of risk premia, but the analysis is really a statistical analysis in nature. All right. That's not a shortcoming of the paper. That's just a statement of the state of the literature, right? So what the paper is going to do is going to take the state of the literature as given and say, listen, there are a lot of approaches that people are commonly using out there, and many of them are flawed. They lead to improper inference in many settings. And the whole modus operandi of the paper is going to be, how can I essentially improve and avoid these pitfalls in my estimation? It's going to be a big picture perspective on factor modeling. So it's going to join a large and growing recent literature on what you might think of as sort of meta analysis of factor models. And the last thing I want to say is that if you really wanted to boil this paper down to its key components, I would state it in these two ways. First, there's a big emphasis on robustness of inference to what we would call useless factors, noise factors, right? And this builds on a distinguished lineage that goes at least back to Kahn and Zhang in 1999, right? We know that there are lots of problems in inference that arise in, this, in, in the presence of useless factors. So the paper is going to pay a lot of attention to that. The other big component that it pays attention to is how do I search across many different models and do comparisons between these models and possibly select the best models among the set, right? So this builds on a more recent lineage that I would trace back to just probably Borelis and Schenken as probably the most notable element. So think about this paper as focusing first and foremost on these two questions and merging them into one unified approach to solving essentially both questions at once. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Svetlana. Um, thanks so much, Brian, for the great, great, great introduction. So now we're going to have Svetlana, who will present her paper, Bayesian Solutions for the Factor Zoo. We just ran two quadrillion models. Svetlana, please go ahead. Thank you so much for a great introduction, Brian. So this is a joint work with Jen Tao, Huang, and Christian Juliet from LSC, who are both uh, here today, and they will be able to answer all your questions, for example, in the chat. I would like to start by showing you one picture. These are the number of Google sites that each of the last 10 or so um, AFA presidential addresses uh, have accumulated so far. And this is literally the data from up until today. And what you see is that one paper, one address clearly stands out. What happened in 2011? This was John Cochrane uh, who presented his discount rate paper and essentially coined the term factor zoo. He was then followed by Cam Hari in 2017, talking about the dangers of p-hacking and factor discovery. And so together, just the two of them get more than 1,700 sites already. Interestingly enough, Luigi Zingales' address on whether finance benefits society or not, at the moment has just over 300 sites which on one hand could probably tell you something about the profession as a whole, but of course could be caused by a lot of different things. Factor models are important. They really work horse in so many areas of finance that it's literally kind of pointless to try to um, list all of them together. But before diving into the paper, what I really want to do is take a step back and look a little bit at the big picture. And the big picture is that there are essentially two facts that have come into the forefront of this uh, factor models and estimation over the last uh, decade or so. First is that even estimating a very simple linear factor model can actually be quite a challenging task. For example, it is notoriously difficult to build a confidence interval for cross-sectional measures of fit, such as R squared. Another big issue that plans the estimation of the standalone models is identification. <coughs> is identification. It is often quite easier to get an illusion of high level of fit, significant risk premium for some factors, while in reality, this could be just a statistical artifact similar to the classic weak instruments problem. 
And so the most widespread case that Brian also mentioned and is well known in the literature is the so-called useless factors, or sometimes spurious. And I will explain specifically what I mean by these useless or spurious factors. Isolating them is actually quite hard, as well as restoring inference on these models, and often requires very complicated special techniques. The second problem that we're facing today is the zero factors. Over the last few years, the list of significant cross-sectional predictors has already expanded to more than 400 different variables. And that means that at the moment, we're dealing with literally quadrillions of possible specifications. Some of them could be one factor model, could be five, could be three, or could include 50 different variables. And so naturally that leads to massive model uncertainty and the debate about what are the truly relevant predictors and what is probably even more interesting, can we even do a reliable factor and model selection? Or maybe there is such a big model uncertainty that a lot of the different specifications are essentially doing the same thing. And so it would be difficult to compare or to make a choice between one or the other. So as a result, in the current literature, what you see is an active revelation of a lot of em empirical findings. Um, new methods are being developed almost on a daily basis, new estimators are being proposed, and I think that we're just trying to really understand and what exactly is going to be the data generating process for returns. Naturally, when John Cochrane called the profession to provide solutions to the factor zoo, uh, people answered. And so over the years, there have been developed a plethora of different methods that try to address the problems of the estimation and selection in the uh, factor space. Here you see a very, very short and absolutely incomplete list of some of the recent contributions to this literature. They include uh, techniques that rely on lasso, reduced strong regression, and spanning tests, some of them are frequentist, some of them are Bayesian, using latent factor models, or for example, using just observable factor models. But there is one observation that I would really like to make it clear. So far, there is no general method really that will be able to literally handle that quadrillion of potential models. And handle in a sense that it will be able to shed light whether we should be doing selection or we should be doing aggregation. Something that will be consistent with not only this model uncertainty and selection and factor zoo, but something that could also be easily applied to a simple standalone model where I just find out a new factor and I want to run out, you know, um, a three factor model and estimate the price of risk. Something that would work with both tradable and non tradable factors. And something that would remain statistically valid with misspecification in mind for all these models and also be able to handle this identification failure. And this is really what we try to provide in this paper. We try to provide a unified framework for estimating linear factor models, both standalone and for the case of prediction or comparing or selection among different specifications. So what do we do? Well, this is going to be a Bayesian solution, but I would, I'm going to try to make an effort to talk about it as a frequentist person so that we can use the same language as always. So for single model estimation, we're going to use a Bayesian version of farmer macbeth regressions. So this is going to be a very simple approach that's going to give you estimates of risk premium for different cross-sections, different factors. It's going to work well with a model that had relatively few asset returns, portfolios, and it's going to be able to handle large cross-sections as well. The model is going to give you confidence intervals not only for risk premium, for example, but automatically also for any other object that you might be interested in. For example, cross-sectional R-square, sharp ratio, um, hansen jagannathan distance, whatever is it that you want, you'll be able to get the confidence interval for it literally in a matter of one second without any additional computation, any additional coding. Um, the inference in this model is going to be robust to the spurious and the level factors those which are quite challenging to implement with conventional approaches and usually requires a lot of additional tinkering. Here, you're actually going to get the solution to the spurious factors essentially for free. And it's going to be really, really fast and easy to do. So that 
is regarding the single model specification, the standalone models. And then it's also something that can build up on this and help you with factor selection, model comparison. In particular, um, we're going to show you how to look through the whole space of models, quadrillions of them. It's going to provide a direct measure of model uncertainty and as a result inform the decision whether we should be selecting the best performing model or whether we should actually be doing averaging whenever a clear winner simply does not really exist in the data. Since it's going to endogenously weight the contribution of different models and rely more on those which are fitting the data better, it's also going to be more robust to misspecification. And so you will be getting inference on, for example, risk premium, not just from one equation, but from the whole space of potential models that could exist in the cross-sectional asset pricing. And one final thing I would like to mention is that there are going to be some additional tuning parameters that correspond to how this method works with this model uncertainty setting. And the important thing here is that all of those tuning parameters or big data, or whatever is the kind of definition you want to use, they're all going to be economically motivated. So all the parameters that are required for the estimation of the model are going to be mapped into quantities that all of us are extremely familiar with and actually do have an intuition regarding their uh, potential value. For example, what on average is the sharp ratio you expect to see on the market? How many factors on average maybe the model is going to have? So all of these things, they're actually going to be embedded into the estimation directly. So the long story short, it's going to be a, a simple, we hope, but at the same time, powerful and robust unified framework that allows you to get answers to all of these different questions within internally consistent environment. Now, most of the results that I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you, um, are going to be based on farmer macbeth regressions. That said, the framework is trivially extended into the estimation of a linear SDF model, and I'm actually going to show you some of the results from the SDF as well. But just to be consistent, uh, our focus is going to be Fama Macbeth. Okay, so how are we going to proceed? First, I'm going to talk about, just as a brief reminder, what is the Fama Macbeth estimation? So what is the goal of these cross-sectional regressions? And then I'm going to be talking about estimating standalone models. How does the cross-sectional likelihood look there? What is the Bayesian Fama Macbeth look like? And why it is going to be robust to this identification problem? We're then going to move to factor and model selection or aggregation, or how to handle all of this model uncertainty. And finally, of course, we're going to be talking about the empirical results and what exactly do we learn from this whole quadrillion of possible models. Okay, standalone models. In a standard linear factor model, the goal is to explain the cross-sectional spread and expected returns on a set of securities or portfolios by their exposure to a given list of risk factors, F. This naturally implies the following two-step procedure. So in the first stage, we're going to be regressing asset returns on a set of factors to measure their exposure, betas. And in the second stage, we're going to be taking average returns in all of these portfolios and regressing them against the betas to see whether having different exposure actually is going to lead to different expected returns. Or in other words, whether the factor is priced or not. And so the second stage can be estimated by OLS or GLS regressions, or you can just put both of them together into standard GMM system. But the crucial element here is that these analyses and the risk premium is going to remain valid only if the matrix of betas has full rank. In other words, if the risk premium is identified. And here's a simple example of consumption capim, where I'm trying to price the set of, say, 25 Pharma French portfolios sorted by size and value with a co-movement with non-durable consumption growth. In this example, it looks like the price of risk is not particularly significant with a T-start of just 1.3 while the betas, at least the in sample estimates, they kind of range from two and a half to five and a half. So it looks like there is a lot to say about the slope. But what if I were to tell you that almost all of these betas are essentially the same number? Their standard error is plus minus three. Is risk premium even identified? 
in this case. This actually has been the sort of debate in this literature for quite a few years already, and there is still not a um, kind of common consensus regarding this question. So the two classic examples of these type of problems on risk premia are the so-called spurious factors. These are the case where all the betas are truly close to zero. So the factor is useless in the sense that it doesn't even correlate truly with asset returns. And then there is also the issue of the so-called level factors. That is where there is correlation, but it's just the same across all of the assets. And so there is not enough spread in those betas. Of course, there could be other cases of identification failure and general rank deficiency, but these two are the most widespread ones empirically. The consequences of not recognizing that this is what you're dealing with can actually be quite drastic. So spurious factors are often going to be found to be significant in various empirical applications. They tend to drive out true sources of risk uh, from the models. At the same time, various measures of cross-sectional fit, such as R-square, are often found to be inflated. So in short, you're actually going to find a lot of the stuff priced, wrongly so, if you were not to check if the model is identified or not. And of course, this is a big issue with OLS, GLS, or GMM inference in the linear model. How would all this procedure look like in a Bayesian world? So first of all, as a Bayesian, um, you're thinking about parameters as something that you learn about. So you start with a certain prior, and then you look at the data and you update that prior to get the posterior. Yeah? So this is the learning view of kind of thinking about the model parameters. And one of the standard and simplest way in which you can try to estimate this joint distribution of parameters is through a so-called GIP sampler, where I'm essentially going to be uh, putting the joint likelihood and trying to derive it by decomposing it into a bunch of conditionals. So for example, if I have two variables I'm interested in, x and y, I can first look at the uh, draw a random variable x conditional on y, then y conditional on x, then another x conditional on y, and I can continue this Markov chain and then look at its empirical distribution. So it turns out that by continuously drawing this type of random variables, what I get in the end is actually going to be really, really close to the actual likelihood of the data. Yeah? And so this is how the basic GIP sampler is going to work. So what are the parameters that we are estimating in the Fama Macbeth? Well, we start from the usual time series. Yeah? So there's the variance covariance matrix of returns, and then there's the linear regression. Well, regardless of whether risk premium is identified or not, the standard time series regressions are going to be here completely valid. So we're just going to use the standard diffuse prior, that's essentially going to be flat, and that's going to lead the posterior of the betas, which are centered exactly around the OLS estimates. And furthermore, if you look at the expression, for example, for the variance covariance matrix, you recognize again the same OLS expression you had before. So basically, this is almost exactly identical to just running a simple linear regression. But what about the second step? Remember, these are conditional distributions, yeah? So conditional on already knowing the returns, conditional on already having drawn the betas, risk premia become just one point because it's going to be directly defined by the particular draws of betas and the particular draws of expected return. So it's going to have a Dirac distribution. How does it look, for example, in simulation, an example? Bayesian inference is often kind of criticized by the fact that, oh, well, you're using the prior. But here, all the priors are flat. So if the data is really informative, it's that data that's going to really determine the shape of the distribution. So if I were to look at the um, distribution of the Bayesian estimate of the risk premium for a well-identified factor, it's going to be exactly the same as the standard frequentist approach. So you're not losing anything you're basically getting exactly the same output. However, that is not the case when the model is weakly identified. Here's an example where I'm having an exactly this useless, spurious factor. So this is the case where there's basically no exposure between portfolios and a particular factor that I'm considering. 
the frequentist estimate of the final Macbeth is going to be centered in this case somewhere around maybe minus one percent and it would look like it's actually significant. That is not the distribution you're going to get from the Bayesian procedure. Why is that the case? Well, imagine you have two companies, let's say Apple and Microsoft. Yeah. So for these two companies, their true betas are going to be close to zero. But when I'm going to be drawing those beta j during this mark of change, during this simulation, from the two distributions which are centered essentially at zero, in one particular draw, it will turn out to be that the beta of the Microsoft is going to be higher than that of Apple. And as a result, the risk premium is going to be estimated as a positive number, for example. But in a different draw, it's going to turn out that it's the reverse that's taking place. And it's the beta of the Microsoft that's going to be higher than that of the Apple. And this is why, as I move across different draws, the estimates of the risk premia essentially is going to be changing sign. As a result, the overall posterior distribution of the risk premium associated with these weakly identified factors is actually going to be centered around zero. So you will never find it to be significant. And it's not going to generate any bias in the estimates of truly important and well-identified factors. So this is why in the Bayesian approach, you actually are not going to be contaminated by this problem of identification. And you're going to be getting the solution to it without having to worry about it at all. Now, in a paper, we do lots of different simulations. And we show that this method actually works um, in different settings with small and large cross sections, with small and large number of observations. And um, the beauty of it, however, is that not only it also gives you confidence intervals for, for example, risk premia, along with inference on the particular numbers, but it actually also naturally produces confidence intervals for everything else. Because everything else that also depends on betas or the risk premium is also going to be simulated through these draws. So if I'm looking at the empirical distribution of, for example, R squared, I'm naturally going to be getting the confidence interval for it as well. And here's an example of, again, comparing the frequentist and the Bayesian approach. So on the left, you see the estimation of the model with just a single useless factor. So the true R square here is actually close to zero, a little bit negative because it's adjusted. Yet the in sample point estimates of the R square you get from the standard Fama Macbeth is going to be something like 70%. If you were to do a bootstrap version of the confidence interval for it, like following Llewellyn, Nagel, and Shankin uh, procedure, you'll say that, okay, confidence interval for R square is like 65 to 100%. Pretty wide, but still it's out there. That is wrong because the model is not identified. The true R square is going to be much closer towards zero. And this is the actual distribution that you're going to get from this mark of chain if you were to employ the Bayesian approach. And of course, it's going to be picked exactly to, uh, close to the true number, close to being zero. Okay. So this is how you can get inference for all of the other objects as well. Hans and Jaganat and distance, sharp ratio, alphas, everything you are interested in can automatically be produced within this mark of chains. Finally, here are some of the examples of how the estimation could look like in practice. We have many other examples in the paper as well. Um, here you see some models estimated by OLS or GLS, and in some cases, both the frequentist and the Bayesian approach produce exactly the same numbers. In other cases, the parameters are going to be different. For example, if I'm trying to estimate the liquidity adjusted KPM by Pastor and Stambo, you see that the risk premium associated with the liquidity factor in this cross section is actually going to be 40 times lower, 40% 40, 40 lower and no longer significant. There is also uncertainty regarding cross sectional R square, but again, we can reliably estimate it directly from the data. Okay? So here's how you would estimate the standard, standalone models. This method is very fast to use. It produces everything within literally one or two seconds. Now, we know how to estimate one model. How about several models? Let's start with just two. Well, as Box famously said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. 
This is probably the most widespreadly used uh, code in econometrics. So suppose that you have two models. There is model zero and there is model one. What is the probability that model zero is actually a truth given the data at hand? Well, if you use the standard Bayes law, you'll see that this is gonna be proportional to the probability to observe this data given a specific model. Notice that it looks like a standard likelihood, but there is one important distinction. This is the integrated likelihood because we want to take into account that a model itself is not only where parameters are gonna be taking particular values, but it's the general functional form. So for example, it could be a model that is generated with a SDF coming with two different factors without having to specify what exactly is the risk premium on these factors. And this is why this object is called integrated likelihood or more often called marginal likelihood. If you have ever used information criteria in linear regression, such as BIG, for example, to select the best specification, what you actually have been doing is looking at the approximation to this marginal likelihood. So this is an object that has a profound history and almost all of the statistics and tasks. But this is actually really useful because once we know the relative probabilities of the models, we can use it for factor and model selection. We can use it to compute, um, for example, p-values or test different hypotheses because essentially we are comparing different models against each other. And probably most importantly, we can use it to average or combine different models together to make a joint statement about some of the objects of interest. How does this marginal likelihood work like in the standards case? If I were to use this marginal likelihood and decide whether to retain a model with a particular factor or not, using the standard flat priors that have been predominantly used in almost all of this kind of Bayesian literature beforehand, I'm actually going to find a very weird phenomenon. For some reason, models with useless factors are going to be retained with extremely high probability. Why is that? Well, recall that the selection of the model, the probability of whether the model is a true one or not, is going to be looking at the integrated likelihood. But if you start with a flat prior, and if the likelihood is also flat, your posterior is also going to be flat. It turns out that not only it's going to be just flat, but the integral under it doesn't even exist. So this object, if you were to try to compute it empirically, it's going to be essentially exploding. And this is why if you were to use a flat prior for the risk premium and that risk premium is truly not identified, not pinned down by the data, your posterior is going to be not integrable and model selection using flat priors is going to be invalid. But if we know the reason for this problem, then we also know the solution. When something is too flat, where something where it has the tail so wide that they kind of um, make it impossible to integrate things together. What that means is that we should impose a certain shrinkage on it that is going to regularize different things. And that's exactly the solution we propose in this paper. We propose to regularize the prior for the risk premium by using the spike and slab approach. So if I include a particular factor into the model, that is gamma j is gonna be equal to one, we would assume usually that the prior for the risk premium is going to be centered around zero, but it's going to be fairly wide. How wide? That depends on whether the data is informative about that risk premium. And a natural measure of this informativeness essentially becomes partial correlation between factors and the test tasks. And the intuition for this is very clear, I hope. If there is a lot of correlation between the asset returns and a particular factor, it would seem like you should be able to identify the risk premium because there's going to be a spread in betas. And so the, the prior for the risk premium in this case should be quite wide so that it's the data that's really going to pin down its value. So the prior is not going to be affecting the estimation. However, if I know that there is not enough correlations between the factors and the asset returns, then this prior here is going to be much more narrow. 
it's much more going to be closer concentrated around zero. And as a result, the posterior likelihood essentially is going to be picking up the impact of precisely that type of prior. Furthermore, as we show in the paper, this parameter here that determines the scale, the spike and slab prior, is actually naturally linked to the sharp ratio of a representative factor. And for the range of parameters in about 10 or 20, and I'm going to show you exactly what it corresponds for to in the empirical part, essentially we're going to be using the prior that sharp ratios as high as 0.9, for example, on an annual basis, they could be admitted into the model. Once you know this, once you know the prior, you can write down the likelihood and you can estimate the whole model together using the same sort of Gibbs sampling analog. Step by step, you're going to be drawing parameters one by one and then just aggregating things together. Furthermore, in this particular case, not only we know exactly what are going to be the expressions for the posteriors, but we also know um, close form solutions to every single object that is essentially of interest here, such as marginal likelihood that integrated likelihood of the cross-sectional data. So this is the way in which we can easily estimate and compare millions of models. Just estimate them one by one, and then look what is going to be the probability of a particular one being the true given the data. Millions are definitely already a lot of the potential models, but it's not enough because today we're dealing with quadrillions, as we said. So what do we do? Before going into quadrillions, I think it is useful again to remember how this use of model uncertainty is going to be used in practice. Say your interest in the risk premium of a particular factor, but you don't want to take a stand that it could be estimated from this regression with three different variables. What if there are five? What if there are other controls? Which one is better? Would you trust, for example, a researcher to actually cherry pick the best one and then show you the t start from there? What you should do instead is actually estimate the risk premium from all of these different models and then weight them with the probability of a given model being the true one. If the data is very informative, saying you know this is the real specification that should exist out there, almost 100% weight is going to be put on exactly that equation. And if the data is not really informative, it could be that you're going to have to average quite a few different things. This applies to not only the risk premium, but again, all the other parameters that might be of interest. Sharp ratios, value at risk, hansen jagannathan distance, anything you want, just as long as it's going to be defined across different models. So how do we deal with quadrillions? Because we're going to be averaging information across a large space of these potential models. Well, we can't really estimate them one by one. It would take years, even with current technological um, uh, advances. But what we can do instead is that we can sample them. So remember this idea behind the spike and slope parameter. It's something uh, that describes the risk premium if the factor is inside it, that gamma j is going to be equal to 1, then there is a risk premium sort of attached to it. And if the factor is outside, then there is no risk premium attached to it, it's centered at zero. We can treat this probability as something that we can also try to estimate in the model. So we're going to try to learn about what is the probability that the factor should be inside the model. This is going to be the gamma j parameter. And so we're going to treat it as also something that is going to be sampled across the chain. As with any other parameter, once you sample different things, you also need to specify what is the distribution. The assumption that uh, turned out to be incredibly helpful, and I think quite interesting economically here, is that the probability that this gamma j, that given factor, is going to be part of the model, is going to be driven by better distribution. Why? Because this distribution actually allows you to encode your beliefs about the sparsity of the model. So, for example, for different values of this parameter, you can encode the belief that, on average, I would sort of expect the model to have five factors, or I would expect, on average, the model to have 10 different factors. Or depending on different versions of these parameters, you could also encode the belief 
I've got no idea how many factors there are, and so I'm going to be flat regarding a potential dimension. So all of these can be essentially part of the model. Once you realize this, we, we also show in the paper is that it turns out that all the rest of the parameters, all of these priors and particular choice of the distributions, they're all going to be connected together through three economic objects. First, what is your belief regarding the sharp ratio that could be achieved by a single factor? Second, what is the total sharp ratio that you can achieve in economy with a given model? And third, what is on average you expect to be as the sparsity of the model? How many factors on average you would expect to uh, work in the data? Once you formulate these beliefs, you don't need to tune anything else. You don't need to do anything else because you're going to be pinning down all the parameters for the estimation. So there is no more additional priors. There is no more model uncertainty. So quadrillions of models. We are going to use for the most of the results a very, very standard uh, set of test tasks. So these are going to be uh, 25 size and value portfolios, and these are going to be 30 industry portfolios. So all of the results I'm about to, pre to present to you, of course, they're going to be conditional on that cross-section. But once I go through them, I'm also going to talk about cross-sectional uncertainty and how do we think about it as partially trying to address this arguably very important point. We're going to consider 51 notable factors that have been proposed in the literature. So all the possible combinations of those factors give us um, a little bit more than two quadrillion models. A quadrillion is 10 to the power of 15. If you're a fan of astronomy, that's going to be equivalent to something like 25,000 galaxies. If you're a fan of biology, uh, that's going to be equivalent to 15 human brains in terms of synapses. And um, if you recognize the title of the paper that was borrowed from the original work of Salai and Martin, I just ran to million regressions, at today's CPU speed, this would have been equivalent to considering something like 63,000 versions of Salai and Martin work. There are going to be some extensions to the paper. So the cross-sectional uncertainty, the one that I mentioned, and the out-of-sample exercise. I hope I'll have time to talk a little bit about that as well. And I'm going to show you results that are going to range for different levels of shrinkage. That is where this parameterization that we impose and distinguishing kind of identified and non-identified factors where it's going to be really strong and when there's going to be not much regularization at all. That said, I will highlight you the range of the parameters that corresponds to what we think is kind of reasonable economic priors. Okay? One thing, the last one before we go directly into the results, since we're going to be sampling the model space, what I want to mention here is that for these quadrillions of models, we're not we do not need to actually estimate every single one of them going model by model. Instead, we're going to be learning about the overall features from the data that is spanned by this potential model space. But I will show you some particular examples where we're going to be estimating certain subsets of the models one by one. And the results are going to be extremely consistent with those as well. So first of all, the probabilities that a particular factor is a part of the SDF, is a part of the model. What you see on the graph here are the posterior probability of a particular factor being included into the model for each of those 51 different factors, tradable and non-tradable. And what you essentially here see is that there are three big groups of factors emerging. There's group number one that consists of three variables, HML, market star, and SMB star. These are the only three factors that for the range of economically plausible beliefs on the sharp ratio that corresponds to roughly psi in the area of 10. These are really the only three factors that have the posterior probability of inclusion higher than their prior. So they're strongly sort of supported by the data. There is a second group of factors that regardless of the level of shrinkage, basically have a posterior probability of inclusion being extremely close to the prior. These are the factors that are not really identified in the data. 
They're almost useless, but they could also be level factors. And then there is a group of factors where you see that the posterior probability of inclusion is definitely kind of lower than the prior. This is where the data is very informative. We can estimate the risk premia on these factors in the, in the model. We just don't need it to feed the data. It shouldn't be present out there. So what are these three best factors that definitely should be part of the model? It's HML, no surprise here. It's market star and SMB star. The market star and SMB star are the version of the market and the standard size factor from um, uh, Ken Daniel and Quarter's paper where they try to come up with a version of these factors that hedge unpriced component. So these are like better version of the market or better version of this size effect. If you look at the actual probability of inclusion for different level of shrinkage, and if you also look at the risk premium associated with these factors, you also notice that these are the only three factors that actually have the risk premium which is economically significant. Once you average across all of these different models, again, endogenously assigning higher weight to the model that is better fitting the data, you notice that these are the only factors that really have a sizable risk premium. And furthermore, not only it's sizable, but it's kind of not that far from the actual in-sample return in those portfolios. So in other words, these factors, at least to some extent, they tend to price themselves. Now, it's kind of tempting to say, what if you have missed something? Because after all, these are literally quadrillions of models. Maybe there is some best performing model and you're just not gonna see it in the data. Especially since many people believe that models should be sparse in terms of the celebrated factors, celebrated versions of these different sources of risk. So what we can do is we can estimate all of the models that include no more than five factors every single one of them, from one to five potential factors. This gives us the space of about 2.6 million models. And once we look at the properties of these models, again, probability of a particular factor to be included into the model, or the risk premium associated with a given factor, again, we see exactly the same results. It's the HML, market star, and SMB, which are definitely relatively strongly supported by the data. Everything else is suffering from massive model uncertainty. What are the best performing models out there that we see in the data? Are they sparse, at least in terms of the observables? The answer to that question is no. The majority of the models, and here you see the top 10 that we have estimated, uh, the majority of these models have many, many factors. While HML, market star, and SMB is definitely kind of leaders in terms of the probability of being part of those specifications, but depending on particular model, you also see Olson score, you see the, uh, for example, profitability, you see skewness, you see lots of different things. The bottom row in this table shows you the posterior probability that a particular model is the true one. That means that, according to the data, even the best performing specification that includes something like 20 plus factors has only 1.3% probability of actually being the true data generating process. It's kind of tempting to say that, well, of course, you start with quadrillions of models, you know, there is no way you can distinguish so many of them. So since you start with so many models, of course, the data is not particularly informative, not only about the winner, but about actually the, all the top 10. You see that not only they're tiny numbers, but they're also very close to each other. But actually the data is super informative because you're starting with a prior for each model being the true one of the order 10 to the power of minus 16. And so from 10 to the power of minus 16 to get to 0.01%, that's a tremendous amount of learning. How does the model probabilities overall look like for the top 1,000 specifications? This likelihood surface in the model space is incredibly flat. What that means is there are literally, there are hundreds of models that you would not be able to differentiate against each other in terms of how well they fit the cross-sectional facet returns. In fact, if you want to do 
um, back of the envelope calculation and, for example, do something like a likelihood ratio test between the first model, the best performing one, and, for example, model number 100, you will not be able to reject them. And the p-value that they are the same would be something like 0.25. So they are all almost exactly the same. So there is a lot of uncertainty about what is the true model that is generated out there. We kind of know that um, HML should be there, market star should be there, and SMB star probably should also be there. Yet, we're pretty sure that a lot of the models that we have been using so far as the leader kind of in this reduced form specifications, they're definitely not the true models. So if I were to compare, for example, KPM, Pharma French, and various other three, four, five model uh, parameters with the robust factor model that has those three inside, HML, Market Star, and SMB, it is the robust factor model that would have been definitely supported by the data with a very high degree of accuracy. That said, none of these models enters even top 1,000. So there is big uncertainty. And all of these models are grossly and grossly misspecified. Now, here you see um, the posterior number of factors and the sharp ratios that you get, which are implied by the models. On average, if you look at the distribution for the number of factors, our model includes something like 20, 25 different factors. Yet, the implied sharp ratio from this estimation is not going to be excessive. So the implied sharp ratio is going to be on average something like around 0.9 on an annual basis. This is very, very reasonable numbers if you think about the type of the factors we consider, the frequency of the data, and so on and so forth. I mentioned that all of these results um, so far have been based on the pharma Macbeth regressions. Yet, it is very easy to actually cast the same estimation into the SDF framework. And of course, zeros in the SDF representation, they do not necessarily coincide with that of the Fama Malbes because of that scaling for the factors and the variance covariance matrix. And yet, when we estimate the model with the SDF approach, we actually see qualitatively very, very similar results. In terms of the observables, there is quite a lot of the factors which are included in the model. And the sharp ratio is not exploding at all. What's going on? A lot of these factors are probably going to be just reflecting the same underlying source of risk. There is a lot of the noisy measures of more or less the same underlying sources. And this is exactly what is picked up by the data. These results that I'm showing you, they're unlikely to suffer from kind of in-sample overfitting because we have also done the out-of-sample exercise by splitting the data in two and then looking at how it kind of fitted before and how it's going to be able to explain out of sample the cross-section of return on either the forward or the back, 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 backward looking half of the data. And we find that that shrinkage, that economically motivated priors, they actually are really important. And the model works very well out of sample. The last thing I want to talk about is really the cross-sectional uncertainty. So all of these results, they have been conditional on the cross-section that we have been using. And in general, building an optimal cross-section for model evaluation is not a trivial task at all. In fact, it is one of the most kind of open and still very actively discussed question in the literature. So what we do in this paper instead is that we're going to be taking the revealed preference approach into dealing with cross-sectional uncertainty. Well, why is it revealed preferences? We are going to look at the papers that have been proposing different cross-sectional factors um, since 2007 or so. And we're going to look at what type of cross-sections people have been really trying to explain. Because arguably, you know, you are trying to explain something that matters. You are trying to solve puzzles that matters. And so we're going to look through all of these different papers and try to target exactly that type of data. So, we looked at all of the papers that have been published in top journals. We looked at the papers presented at all the top conferences. We looked through the working papers on SSRN and we managed to get a set of more than 100 different models that all are using slightly different underlying cross-sections and their baseline specifications. We then aggregated them together by keeping, by preserving the empirical weight 
with which a particular cross-section had been used across all of these different papers. And that gave us 25 composite cross-sections. We then repeat the same analysis we did before on all of these other cross-sections, and then we're going to be averaging the results for risk premia, for the factors, for the probability of inclusion across all of these different models, again, observing the revealed preferences weight. And once we do that, what we see is that, again, HML and market star are definitely going to be on top. The SMB star is getting a little bit lower. Uh, momentum, for example, is getting um, increased in terms of the B probability of being part of the model. But still, there is quite a lot of model uncertainty here. I would like to um, talk a little bit about kind of how we view this paper overall. Um, to be honest, we view this paper to a large extent as a general framework on how to think about factor models. And there are many extensions that could make it particularly useful and applied in many different contexts. So for example, we could extend this model to allow for time varying betas or risk premia. Um, we could extend it to include various, let's say, bounded support for risk premium or sharp ratio price or whatever are going to be your economic restrictions you would really like to impose on the model. We can include models with latent factors. There's latent factors that can be priced or can be just driving some common sources of the volatility. And this setting can also be adapted to work with generated factors, for example, mimicking portfolios or principal components. And the beauty of this Bayesian approach is that it's going to explicitly account for the fact that you are estimating these factors. You're not observing them ex ante. So all of this can easily be extended, um, uh, uh, included into the model. And there are many other cases where, in which you can also modify this existing setting. And so this is why I really think that using Bayesian approach it actually might be a, a really nice way to think about all of these different applications in finance because it can be used for estimating standalone models and again automatically produce all the confidence intervals everything you want it's also going to be robust to identification challenge which has been and still remains a challenge for a lot of the um, estimators it is going to be applied to potentially both tradable and non-tradable factors and it literally is very easy to use. So once we look at how the model works across the whole model space, what we find out is that actually there is only a handful of factors which are robust predictors of the risk premium. So these are basically three variables the out of 51 that we kind of reliably say, yeah, they should probably be there. That said, there is massive model uncertainty. We found that there are hundreds of models that are doing more or less exactly the same thing. And so it is impossible to really distinguish, you know, which among them is the, the best one because they're all doing more or less the same job and likely representing the same economic underlying sources of risk. Yet, we found that the majority of these reduced factor models that people have been using, all these sparse models that include three, four or five factors, they're all grossly misspecified and they do not even enter the top 1000. The best models, they include a lot of the observable factors. And while some of them may be not identified in the data, they're gonna be completely harmless with this approach and it's still gonna remain valid. And so thank you very much for attention. Um, this is uh, what I wanted to say. I'm gonna- uh, Okay, great. Thank you so much. And um, Brian, can you please take on on the mic and do your um, discussion. All right, great. Okay, so I don't have a lot of time to discuss here, so I'm just going to hit on a couple of facts uh, questions briefly. So first of all, I want to spend some time um, asking a question which is related to a question that Irina asked in, um, in the Q&A section. So to what extent should we be worried about useless factors and developing methods to counteract useless factors versus thinking about correlated factors? So useless factors are very close to the core of what the authors are trying to deal with here. They have this quote in the paper about factor proliferation and spurious factors being tightly connected problems. We know we have this factor proliferation stylized fact that is sort of dominating a lot of the view of, of 
modern factor asset pricing. Um, and I would agree that the, the proposed model is very well suited to deal with this. Um, but I often wonder about how harmful are useless factors uh, if I'm thinking about things like uh, the, the broad statistical inference of what is the correct model from a large set of models. Um, I sort of think that we should be able to filter out bad factors, useless factors, fairly easily ahead of time. And they shouldn't enter into the model set that we're considering when we're choosing between models. Um, what I think is probably a bigger problem is what I would think of as a correlated factor problem as opposed to a useless factor problem. And I think these are, these are sort of fundamentally different. So when I'm thinking about correlated factors, it's not just that I have two factors that are correlated with each other. It's more that they're both noisy versions of some true underlying factor. So when you have that type of arrangement, there's immediately some benefits from factor combination, right? So I think what the authors would be well served to do would to spend some time speaking to this in their paper. I think they have a lot of machinery in place to help resolve some of these questions, but because so much of the exposition is targeted towards useless factors, uh, from my reading, it sort of missed what I would think of as kind of the more, the more prominent empirical issue that we face with. So I think about factor, factor proliferation is not that the literature is generating a bunch of new useless random factors. It's that we're rediscovering a lot of factors um, with little tweaks here and there. Um, and you know, if I have two noisy versions, then, then a dimension reduction approach built in to what's going on here might be better served than something that's going to try and essentially be a, a model selection or a lasso type of approach to choosing factors. Um, a couple of other comments that I'll make very quickly. Apologies for going through this um, with speed, but the issue of non-tradable factors is again something that seems to me not very well suited for statistical factor analysis. Okay, so what I think is an excellent attribute of this model when it comes to non-tradable factors is that non-tradable factors, those that are hypothesized by theory usually, are exactly the ones that we tend to find being truly useless in practice. And I think about the way we explore those factors is investigating one-off models, which is totally separate from the model selection and model comparison question, right? So I think a lot of the machinery of the spike and slab is good for determining when you might have a useless non-tradable factor showing up. Um, but again, that's exactly the type of factor that I think we could easily winnow out before we get to the model selection and model comparison step. I mean, keep in mind, we have tons of empirical evidence now that tells us that no non-tradable factors reliably show up as being useful for pricing the cross-section of asset returns. All right. Um, let's see if there's anything else that I want to hit here because I don't want to spend too much time. Um, let me just stop there because we're already over time. I ate too much of Svetlana's time in my introduction already. Let me just summarize by saying, I think this is an excellent paper. I learned an enormous amount from it. Um, and I recommend that we move to Q&A. Um, okay, great. Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, so Svetlana, maybe you wanna answer to Brian's comments a little bit before we move to Q&A. And also people, please uh, raise your hands if you have questions and we're gonna call on you. Sure. Thank you so much for great comments, Brian. Really appreciate it. Let me briefly try to address maybe a couple of points. So first, in general, kind of pre-selecting or pre-testing factors is a bad idea. So similar to actually pre-testing instruments when we're doing, for example, IV or something like that, it introduces bias in the estimates and the analysis that is done exposed. And this is why in the recent um, econometric literature, there actually have been a lot of pushback against any kind of pre-selection, pre-filtering in the first place. Um, the second thing I wanted to address is those noisy proxies of the same underlying kind of thing. This is actually something that we thought about it and we have explored it in the simulation, but it's not in the paper yet. Um, so what's gonna happen in this case is since we're not kind of estimating things in the usual sense, we are simulating them as in the Bayesian approach, your likelihood is actually going to be very well defined. So you're going to get the right kind of sharp ratio, you're going to get the right, you know, model parameters, R square and everything else, yet individually the price of risk associated with these factors, they're actually going to be quite wide as you would expect 
but it's going to converge to exactly kind of how you could evaluate the best combination of those factors. And if you have different noisy proxies and try to do selection there, then this approach asymptotically is going to select the one that has the highest signal to noise ratio. So in final sample, there's going to be uncertainty because they're all doing more or less the same thing, but ultimately it's going to choose the one it's going to put more weight on the one that has the highest signal to noise ratio. Right? Okay, great. Uh, so now we're going to go to questions which were raised in chat. So Irina uh, from AGC, uh, she's going to ask the first question. Irina, please go ahead. You should be unmuted. Hello, everyone. Um, so I was wondering actually about um, the following question. I was wondering about how the problem of um, level factors is handled here, as well as the problem of factors that are not correlated, but work in the following sense. Uh, let's assume I have a cross-section. And just to simplicity, let's assume this is a cross-section of currency returns. And I have, say, two factors. And these factors could be actually orthogonal. But these two factors are such that um, exposures of returns to these factors look very similar in the sense that they're monotone. So for example, high yield currencies have high exposures to both factors and low yield currencies have low exposures to both factors. So then if you do the classic Fama Macbeth in the second stage, you're going to have multicollinearity problem. So it's going to be a huge problem for in, uh, inference problem for the risk premium. So I was wondering if uh, this uh, new approach can handle this question and how. And uh, as, uh, as it concerns the level factors, so here's the question is more like, so if we start combining uh, different cross sections of assets into a big cross section, for example, um, stocks and uh, currencies, uh, it could be the case that different cross sections have different level factors. And so these level factors matter for one cross section, but not another one. And so if you estimate exposures, the exposures are going to look very similar for a specific sub, sub cross section, but um, exposures for a different sub cross section are going to be zero. So to me, it seems like, again, a difficult problem to handle in the two stage estimation. And so maybe your Bayesian method can address this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Rina. Both are great questions. Um, so I think the first one is um, related to also the concern that Brian had um, regarding those factors that could be kind of noisy proxy or more or less regarding the same thing. Or they could actually be representing different things, but it just so happens that those vectors of betas across different assets, they could be collinear with each other. So what's going to happen in this case in the Bayesian approach is again, sharp ratios, um, uh, different other kind of overall model characteristics, they're gonna be sharply estimated. Individually, those parameters are not gonna be significant risk premium. So for example, for two collinear factors, what you're gonna see is that the risk premium for each of them is gonna have a relatively wide support, but that's because their linear combination is gonna be very sharply pinned down. And so the mode of their distribution is actually gonna be centered around, for example, one half of that total risk premium that they together, for example, could explain in the data. But individually, what you're gonna see is that their domain is gonna be quite large. That said, again, overall, the model is gonna be very sharply identified. So um, expected returns, R squared, sharp ratios, like all of those things, they're gonna have very nicely kind of behaved objects. There are gonna be no distortions there, but individual parameters, you will see that they are not significant, though their in-sample estimates are gonna be centered around where you would expect them to be centered given the potential multicollinearity or something like that. Regarding the second um, question, um, Yes, so factors sort of heterogeneity and risk premium heterogeneity, of course, it's a massive concern. And the model can be adopted, for example, to include certain heterogeneity in the loadings so that you would expect that there are gonna be slightly different factors, for example, governing all different types of cross sections. You can embed that as well. Um, we are thinking about how to properly deal with this kind of cross-sectional uncertainty and the fact that you should probably try to do inference from the most informative assets 
but it's not clear how to define the informative assets within this particular setting. And so this is still kind of like an open question for us, but in terms of, not only for us, but actually for profession overall, but in terms of the overall inference, uh, you can add various heterogeneity objects there as well. Um, okay, great. So the next question will be from Kenneth Ahern from USC. Kenneth, please go ahead. Hi, I had a question about your uh, cross-sectional test using the um, the test assets that you, you chose to use. So you're using the Fama French size book to market um, basis for your assets. Uh, and then you had those extra cross-sectional tests where you looked at all the the assets that were used in different conferences and so on. But those all basically are size, book to market, momentum in industry. And so if you look at test assets that are, that generate greatest variance in uh, size or book to market, is it surprising that those are the factors that, that show up as significant in your tests? And alternatively, can you look at other factors such as you know, the basis assets approach that uh, on uh, Conrad and Dittmar do that that doesn't have any kind of preconceived um, uh, 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 way to, to sort the data. Um, thank you so much for your question. This is also a great comment. Um, indeed, when you're doing different cross-sectional analysis here, it's gonna depend on a particular choice of the cross-section. We try to look at what people have been using out there. And so we end up with this 25 different cross-sections. And to be honest, uh, it's probably gonna be fair also to all of these papers that they are focused on size and value. That said, uh, even for a lot of the cross-sections that people have been using, those factors that explain most of the time series variation out there, like think of principal components or something like that, are not necessarily those which are gonna be aligning cross-sectionally. And again, um, for example, industry portfolios are probably gonna be here, a very, very good example. Um, we have tried to implement this analysis on some other recently proposed cross-sections that are not really focused on this conventional sorting. So for example, I know that another co-author of mine, Markus Pelger, is also currently online. So we have a paper where we try to build optimal cross-section of portfolios that are reflecting information contained in a given set of characteristics. And they kind of like treat all of them in an equal footing. And um, you can get a set of portfolios, for example, that reflects, let's say, 10 characteristics at a time. So we've done the analysis on those cross-sections as well. And again, apologies, not in the paper because it's all have been quite recent events. And what we have seen is that a lot of the results, again, are gonna be remaining exactly the same. Obviously not all, because depending on the characteristics, different factors, for example, could be boosted up or could actually lower in terms of the probability of inclusion of the risk premium. But qualitatively, a lot of the results stay exactly the same. Okay, thanks. Just a quick follow-up. When you use the industry uh, portfolios, I I'm assuming you're using Fama French industry portfolios, yes. those are based on information from 1987. So because SIC codes are not updated after 1987. So you might want to consider a different kind of industry portfolio too, based on current industry codes or at least updated industry codes. But you know, that's uh, something that everybody does. So. No, that's, that, that's, that's a good suggestion. We could definitely do that. Sure. Right, thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, so I think we have a couple more questions, but uh, we're gonna wrap up because we're out of time. So thanks so much Svetlana for the great talk, Brian for the great discussion and moderation. And so we hope to see you all next week uh, for to see Bernard Horvick, no, uh, Herskovic, sorry, uh, from UCLA to talk about hedging risk factors with Greg Duffy from Johns Hopkins moderating and discussing. Thanks so much, guys, for attending and for giving the talk and discussion.